And kids, remember, stay seated during the word, and please don't, don't move around during the word if you'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lord, we love you. Come on, one more time, join me in prayer. Lord, we love you this morning. Lord, we, we mean that. We mean give us Jesus no matter what it looks like, no matter what it sounds like, no matter how long we have to linger, no matter how long we have to wait. We want you, Lord. Lord, we choose right now to crucify flesh and to lean in to hear the word of the Lord. Lord, I pray that by the end of this weekend, we would never be the same. We would be ruined. We would be wrecked. Lord, I pray that over every heart in this room, no matter the age, no matter how long they've been saved. Lord, I pray that by the end of this weekend, we would leave with a greater hunger and love for you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. If you have your Bible, can you turn with me to John chapter number 2, starting in verse 13. John 2, verse 13. Come on, are you excited to be at Winter Ramp this year? I believe God has you here for a reason. He has you here for a purpose. And, and I encourage you, don't miss a moment don't miss a moment in worship. Don't miss a moment in prayer. Don't allow yourself to get distracted. Don't allow yourself to check your phone. Lean into everything God has for you this weekend. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. It's a very popular story. You've probably heard it before, but I feel the Lord is speaking something very clearly to us. It says this in verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Everybody say doing business. Verse 15. And when he had made... A whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now flip over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 16. It says this, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Verse 17, If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Look at your neighbor and say, It's time to cleanse the temple. Look at your other neighbor and say, you better get ready. <laughs> you know, I'm excited about this word this morning. Last night we were in worship and I began to see the Lord uh, uh, play this out in my mind, the scripture of, of Jesus coming into the temple and really just messing everything up. Earlier we prayed that. And I'm telling you, that's a dangerous prayer for you to pray when you say, Lord, mess me up. Amen. Some of y'all are, are in the cool club. Listen, the ramp's not one of those places you come to be cool. The ramp's not one of them places you come to meet girls. Amen. Amen. The, the ramp's not one of them places. Listen, you, uh, by the end of the weekend, you will, we have reverse peer pressure here. By the end of the weekend, if you're not dancing and going crazy and sweating, your mascara is dripping off your face, you're the weird one. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and I, my prayer, and, and I've seen it, God do it in my life. I've seen God do it. And, and everyone that comes to the ramp, when you pray that prayer, God mess me up. He'll do it. And, and as I begin to see this last night and God began to speak this word to me, uh, I feel this morning the Lord, before we can go any further, because listen, we're just getting started. We, we haven't really, we're just now stepping into what God wants us to do. God has so much more for us. But before we can go any further, the capacity in which you receive of God has to be increased. And it can't be increased if you are hosting illegitimate things in your heart. Things have to be cleansed out of your life and your heart before you can go any further in Him. And this story, I love it because uh, it's actually mentioned in a couple of other Gospels as well, Matthew and in Mark. And in Mark 11, I love that version of it because the Bible says that Jesus and his disciples come to Jerusalem and it says that they go to the temple. And the Bible says they got to the temple and the hour is was late and Jesus just looked around at everything. 
He walks into the temple. It's late at night and he sees everything and he gets his disciples and they leave and they go back to Bethany where they're going to wait to come back into the next morning. What does that show me? Jesus walked into the temple and he just let it fester. He walked into the temple and he saw that things were off and he saw that things were up and and he could have acted right there. He could have done something right there, but rather he left and let what he saw just kind of fester in his heart. And he goes, and it's intentional that, that, that even John points out that he made a whip of cords. So he would have went back with his disciples, and he probably would have been like, John, I need you to go find me a rope. And they probably learned with Jesus, don't question anything that he says. They're just like, just, just do it. I don't know. Go find me a rope. And, and while his other disciples were talking, and they were probably going to sleep and try, trying to get rest, Jesus was probably sitting to his side Making a whip. And you've got to understand how confusing this must have been to the disciples as Jesus. Listen, I truly believe with all my heart. I I know it. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Bible says in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. I truly believe Jesus, uh, when he walked the earth, was was the happiest uh, thing to ever fill the earth. He still is happy. Amen. Jesus is full of joy. And... In this moment, I can sure they saw his demeanor. There was something on his mind as he was making a whip. And then the next morning, they, he probably woke them up early because how many of you know when something's on your mind, you got to do it fast? Especially when something's annoying you. I mean, how many confrontational people do I got in the room? You know what I'm saying? Somebody annoys you, just like, hey, you, you annoy me. <laughs> Amen. And so the next day, Jesus wakes his his disciples up. They make their way to Jerusalem. And I just, I would love to see what would have happened when the disciples, disciples are happy. They're in the temple. They're, man, this is awesome. This is great. And Jesus, all of the sudden, pulls out a whip. (laughs) And the disciples were like, probably like, Peter, what did you do? (laughs) Who, what? You know, Peter probably like leaned back. He's like, bro, I know that whip's for me. Like, <laughs> he pulls out a whip and Jesus walks into the temple, begins to overturn tables, pulls out the whip, starts whipping animals. I'm sure he whipped a few humans too, just like, whoop And they're like, ugh. They're like, who are you? He's flipping. Coins are going everywhere. And it's chaos. And Jesus is the one at the center of the chaos. And that goes against everything our generation believes about Jesus. We believe Jesus is just this nice hippie with long hair and perfect white teeth who wears chacos. And he's just like, hey, do you mind not doing these things? (laughs) Jesus didn't go in and ask for the manager. (laughs) Excuse me, is there a customer service survey I can fill out? He didn't go in and say, guys, this is not necessarily how to be, but, you know, I'll over it. No, no, no. He went in with indignation, and he was the one causing all the chaos, causing all the awkwardness. He was the one that caused the entire temple to shut down as he was cleansing it. And, and even in that moment, I love it because his disciples were probably like, floor, like, what is he doing? And what does it say? It says this, then they remembered the scripture that says, zeal for your house has consumed me. And what I feel this morning, before we move further, the Lord wants to cleanse his temple. And you, my friend, are the temple that he is zealous for this morning. You see, uh, the, the temple, even this place, what, what was happening was people were coming into the temple to worship. And in order for them to worship properly, they had to purchase animals for sacrifice. They had to even exchange their money for, for the money of the temple, which is the Tyrrhenian shekel. They had to exchange their money in the temple. And, and what they were doing wasn't necessarily wrong. The problem was, get this, it wasn't necessarily wrong. The problem was they allowed what should have been going on outside to get in on the inside and a lot of the stuff in your temple might not necessarily be sin it's just worldliness that has gotten on the inside 
It's busyness. It's distraction to where the temple should be a place. As Jesus said, my temple shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Rather than being a place of prayer, it has become a place of business. What was meant to be holy isn't holy anymore. And, and I, I want to charge us this morning. We need a fresh revelation of the holiness of God. A, a fresh revelation of who He is and, and the holiness that, that, that is the character and the nature of God. Think about it like this. You know, Matt mentioned it earlier in Revelation chapter 4 that, that these living creatures circle the throne of God day and night, and they have for, for all of eternity, and they will for all of eternity, saying one word holy, holy, holy. Get that? They're not circling his throne saying love, love, love. Or justice, justice, justice. Or mercy, mercy, mercy. No, they're crying holy, holy, holy. And, and what my heart for us is today is that even as the Psalms describes it, that we would worship him in the beauty of his holiness. You need to encounter the beauty of his holiness today. Listen, there's something beautiful about the holiness of God. The problem is we've, we've allowed uh, Satan, we've allowed the world to, to say that holiness is not something enjoyable. And that holiness is a bad thing and holiness means you got to wear a, a jean skirt to the floor. If you wear a jean skirt to the floor, no shame. You know, amen. Like, but, we, but we've allowed holiness to be something that we do or don't do rather than it being the nature that describes our holy God. The, the, the Hebrew word Kadesh, he's holy, he's separate, he's different. And, and listen to me, generation, we've got to get back to the place where we honor and revere holy things once more. Where, you know, when I was growing up in church, I knew if I laughed, my mom or some other random old lady <laughs> will slap me so hard in the back of the head. You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about like laughing because something's funny. I'm talking about being silly, being goofy, making fun of something that's happening. That was just something you didn't do. And, and this is the charge, man. I feel this so random. It's been on my heart for weeks now. But I want to give us as a generation an encouragement. Be careful about the things you laugh at concerning the things of God. And listen, I love a good meme. I share memes. I like memes. I send memes to some people. Like everybody. I, just, I like a good meme. But what I'm starting to see is a trend in this generation is we're taking holy things from God and we're turning them into memes and that's dangerous. When, 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 when people now have to be aware of how they worship because they don't want to end up on Instagram on some meme account. I'm telling you, you got to be careful. Amen. Amen. <laughs> There's a certain minister, I won't say his name, but every now and every, um, you probably, I, don't, I, should, I mean, it's not a big deal, but at, you know, spring forward, fall backwards, they say it's Benny Hinde, set your clocks back, or something like that, fall down. I don't share that stuff. You know why? Because I honor the man of God. And you better believe if I see somebody making fun of speaking in tongues, I'm taking a few steps away because you're about to. <laughs> That's one thing I don't mess with. I want to keep what's holy, what is holy. I want to keep what's sacred, what is sacred. You can laugh about it all day long, but when you start to wonder why you're not encountering God, maybe it's because you made a joke out of it. Don't joke with the holiness and the things of God. We need the fear of the Lord. I truly believe the fear of the Lord and the holiness and reverence of God to be restored in our hearts once again. 
Jesus walked into the temple and something stirred in his heart enough to say, I can't leave things the way they are because the temple is not clean. I can't go into worship because there's too much noise that stands between me and the presence of God. And listen, what I'm afraid of is that we are getting to a place where even like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times it's sin, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we're just not in a place to honor God as who He is because of the noise and the chatter and all of the stuff going on on the inside. He is holy. My prayer for you is that you would encounter this weekend the beauty of His holiness. I'm telling you, there's a moment in worship where it's like everything else fades away. I I love it. There's, you know, oftentimes it's the glory, it's the presence, it's the Shekinah, it's the holiness of God. When all of a sudden you just become so aware of His presence, you just have to like get low to the ground. You have to humble yourself because of the holiness of God that fills the room. But I want to tell you, listen to this, the holiness of God that fills this room, God doesn't just want to fill a building, He wants to fill you. There used to be a song that said, Here, O Lord, have I prepared a resting place. Long have I desired for you to dwell. Here, O Lord, have I prepared for you a home. Can I, I want to ask you this morning, can God, the presence of the holy living God, dwell on the inside of you? What are you hosting in your life that is keeping you from hosting the presence and the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 3 says that so clearly. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Think about that. Your body, who you are, the thoughts that we think, what we entertain ourselves with, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, I, and listen, my prayer, I've, I've been feeling this so strongly. My prayer is that I believe that before this weekend's over, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. You're going to be filled with the Spirit of the living God. Because I'm telling you, when you get filled with the Spirit of God, everything changes. Everything changes. It's, it's impossible to go back to who you used to be once you get filled with the Holy Ghost. You're ruined for everything else. Why? Because you have tasted of that heavenly gift. You've tasted of that holiness that fills your heart. And here's the beautiful thing. Even Scripture in 1 Peter 1.13, it gives us the charge. Peter gives us the charge. And this is literally the Lord saying, you shall be holy even... As I am holy. That, that's Yahweh. That's the creator of the heaven and the earth. The one who angels circle his throne day in and day out. And cry holy, holy, holy. He's giving us a charge. And he's saying you will be holy even as I am holy. Rebecca will be holy even as I am holy. John will be holy even as I am holy. He's giving you that charge. And he's giving us an invitation into his holiness. That he desires us to be transformed into the likeness of his image. I'm telling you, his holiness is an amazing thing. Holiness in our lives is not something to be dreaded. Holiness in our lives is something to be pursued. That, That word holiness is sacred. It's Kadesh. It's separate. It's different. It it means there's none like him. There's none beside him. And as God transforms us into his image and we begin to walk in that same holiness and same righteousness. You might hear yourself, well, what does it mean to be the temple? Listen, the temple is a place that is dedicated to hosting the presence of God. 
The temple is a place that is dedicated to hosting the presence of God. And we sang this earlier. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Uh, there, there's one thing I desire. There's one thing I seek. And I want to ask you this morning, do you mean it? Do you mean it? Do you want him above all else? Is there a cry on the inside of you that you've had enough with the ways of the world? You've had enough with the things of the world? You've tasted the pleasures of this age and you've come to a place to say, that will never satisfy me. I have to have him. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care where I got to clean out. I've got to have more of him. Do you want him this morning? It's a place dedicated to host the presence of Jesus. And listen, as we read this earlier, Jesus came in and began to overturn tables. He began to drive the money changers out. He began to push everything out. And he said, this zeal for your house has consumed me. And I want to read you the scripture from 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. I love it because what this does is it perfectly represents, I believe, what happens when zeal for his house fills your heart and you gain zeal for his house. Amen? That I believe there's a moment this morning where, listen, you've got to understand, Jesus wasn't coming in anger. He was coming towards zeal and holy, righteous indignation. And I want to tell you this morning, he, he's zealous for you. His name is Jealous Jealous. The Bible says that he is a consuming fire, jealous God. Listen, he will not share you with another. He will not share you with the things of this world. Literally, that's why the Bible says, do not love the world or the things of this world. And what I'm afraid is we are courting the things of the world when God is passionately pursuing our hearts. Like, okay, so imagine you're dating, okay? Imagine you got a bay. all right? Now, imagine things are going good. By the way, you're older and have a J-O-B, so you're allowed to date. Your mom doesn't have to take you to see Spider-Man, you know? You know? Valentine's is coming. You're not to be like, hey, mom, can I buy my girlfriend something? Because you have an actual job. And yeah, anyway. Um, so say, you know, or let's, let's do this better. You're engaged to be married. They got the ring on it. You went to K's. Every kiss begins with K. <laughs> you proposed at Olive Garden. <laughs> do not propose at Olive Garden. And I beg you. <laughs> I beg you. You're like, can we get some more breadsticks? You know, like. <laughs> you're engaged to be married. And, and while you're engaged to be married, you're like, hey, honey, what do you want to do tonight? Let's go, let's go to the movie. Let's go hang out. So excited to get married. And they say, oh, well, I, I would love to. Maybe we can go tomorrow night. But tonight, Johnny's taking me out. Yeah, you know, like, Johnny's saying, you, know, you know, we like each other. But I'm engaged to you. I love you. But, but I really like Johnny as well. So maybe we can work out a deal. No. But how oftentimes in our own hearts... Do we sing of the love of God and we sing of our affection towards Him? But in reality, we're courting other lovers. We're, we're searching the world for other things when in reality, we have been betrothed to Him. So, so listen, this is, I love this picture of repentance, okay? It's 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow, Godly sorrow, 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 same thing. <laughs> Godly sorrow produces repentance. Let me just say this right here. 
Stop shielding yourself from godly sorrow. We're a generation that says good vibes only and I just want to protect myself. And, you know, and if you start feeling good and convicted, you'll leave because you got to take care of your... No. you got to take care of me and I just, I'm not good for me. Right? No, 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 no. Godly sorrow. I'm not talking about shame. I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when the love of God highlights something in your life you need to repent of. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world, this is it, the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world is shame and guilt and heaviness and legalism. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about godly sorrow, the sorrow that's on the inside of you that says, whatever is separating me from you, Lord, I give it to you. Verse 11, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. I love this. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Listen, That is the fruit of repentance. John the Baptist said, bear therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And listen, there's a time in your life where repentance is more than going to an altar, kneeling for 30 seconds, getting up and going back to who you used to be. No, repentance is going and producing the fruits of repentance with zeal, with clearing of yourselves. I want to ask you, what things in your life is the zeal of the Lord stirred up against? What vindication, what zeal has continued? I'm telling you, on this walk with God, conviction is a blessing. For even Hebrews would say, for if you are not convicted, if you're not chastised, you are an illegitimate son. The proof that I am a child of God is the conviction in my life. And I know it hurts and it doesn't feel fun. We've all been there when you're like, oh, I just sinned. Amen. Some of you are like, my, my, my goodness, I've never done that before. No, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You do something and you're just like, oh. Tell me, that is the blessing of the Lord, and you better, when you stop feeling that, that's when it gets dangerous. But listen, I believe even if you stopped feeling that, the Holy Spirit is here, here to soften the hardest heart. On this walk with the Lord, listen, some of you are starting it this weekend. Some of you have been doing it for a while. You will be convicted a lot. And guess what? I I, I never believe we get to a place where we got to stop laying stuff down. I'm 31 years old this year. And he still does it. Amen? Amen. Older saints, youth pastors, pastors, just wave at me. Parents, you know what I mean. And I'm telling you, and it's the journey of the Lord because I know that whenever he highlights something in my life, whenever there's a table in my temple that needs to be overturned, whenever there's something unclean in my life, the Holy Spirit touches. I know it is an invitation to grow in my walk with the Lord. So I want to carry the same zeal that he carries to drive it out of my heart. As I'm telling you, man, he's going to ask you to do stuff today. Today, this morning, you're not going to understand. And guess what? He is not obligated to give you a reason. Amen? Like I remember driving down the road. I just got saved and, you know, I'm like living for the Lord. And, um, you know, and, and I, I had this Hillsong uh, CD that I stole off the Internet. And the Lord convicted me about that later, not that moment. Anyway, um, that's back when you used to be able to go online and just steal stuff, amen. And I don't condone that. Do not download LimeWire on your computer. It'll destroy your computer. And 
I had this other CD, though, that was like my, like, I had some, like, rap music on there, you know what I'm saying? Like some outcast, you know. Y'all don't know nothing about I had these random, like, random, just a mix CD that I had with just random artists and random albums that I would put in. And I remember I was driving on the road, I had my windows down, I put it in, I was starting to jam. I was like, yeah, come on. You know, like, I'm rapping along to the lyrics, and I hear Holy Spirit so clear. It's one of the first things he ever asked me to do. He just literally said, throw it out the window. I'm driving down the road. And I hear the Lord say, throw it out the window. I'm like, but Lord, is there a trash can? No, throw it out the window. So I grabbed that thing like a disc. It just, I mean, I, I, I threw it in oncoming traffic. It zipped off into the woods like... But listen, there's going to be things in your life you don't even know about. You think that they're okay. It's not a big deal. Everybody does it. But listen, never get to the place where you resist God saying, hey, I need this. Because sometimes it's not even bad stuff. It's just stuff that keeps you from Him. I remember a few years ago, too. It's so funny I'm talking about music. But I was driving. I was traveling somewhere. And I will just, you know, you get bored. And I start flipping through the radio stations. And this song comes on, I think, by this guy named, like, Bruno Mars. I don't listen to him. But for I'm just, I'm skipping through. I'm, and then, but I like, like, the old, like, funky music, like, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And it was a song called uh, 24 Karat Magic. Put your, put your, did it, boom, dun, dun, dun. and I was like, <laughs> I was like jamming, and all of a sudden in the lyrics, I hear him say the name of Jesus, and I hear the Lord speak to me and say, you are never allowed to listen to the song again. And there's been times I've been driving down the road, flipping the register, and it come on, I'd be like, Lord, this slaps, you know, like, <laughs> and I hear the voice of the Lord say, I told you to do something a few years ago. I have not changed my mind. And what you'll find in this walk of the Lord, there will be things in your life He's going to ask you to do that you're not going to understand. And church, you don't need to understand it. You just need a heart of obedience that says, God, whatever's going to grieve you, whatever's going to push you away, I want to guard it. Why? Because I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. And listen, as you walk in communion with God and you walk with that sensitivity of the Holy Spirit, it is such a blessing for Him to be able to come close and prick those things in your heart and say, lay it down. Why? Because He's he's giving you an invitation to host His presence. If you invited someone over to your house and something offended them, would you continue to do it? No, no, no. As we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, we need to be guarded about the things that are keeping us from Him. So this morning, what I, the, way, the way I want to finish this and really wrap this up is, We're going to have a moment. Team, you can go ahead and come on out. I feel just to have a moment where we worship God in the beauty of His holiness. And and a, a moment that we encounter His holiness. Why? Because when you encounter His holiness, you will have a greater desire to walk in holiness. When you encounter the beauty of who he is, you will find within yourself this same thing that 2 Corinthians talks about where it says, what manner of clearing. And my prayer for you today is that the Lord, even as he is zealous, I feel this for each one of our hearts, as the Lord is zealous to purify our hearts. Listen, listen, listen. There would be no resistance from us. There would be nothing in us that says, Lord, Lord, yes, yes, you can. Here, here's the deal. You can take this, and, and we kind of go into negotiating mode. Like, you can take this, and, but, but, but me and my boyfriend or me and my girlfriend, we'll just continue to date. 
we'll just put up stricter boundaries. When the Lord is saying, I'm not asking you to put up stricter boundaries. I'm asking you to lay it down. Or you're saying, no, 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 Lord, Lord, I, I know that I'm harboring this bitterness in my heart, but you don't know what they did to me. And he said, no, no, I'm not asking you. I know they hurt you. I know they broke your heart, but I'm asking you to let it go. What we're going to do right here, just really quietly, let's stand all over the room. Don't talk. What I want us to do is we're going to have a moment where we're just going to focus our attention and our affection on Him. We're going to worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. And my prayer, even as we pray earlier, that this God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, that you would encounter the one that they call holy. And then in a few minutes, we're going to have a moment where I believe Jesus is going to step in and overturn some tables in your life. I believe we're going to have a moment where, where, where he's going to step in. He's going to drive some stuff out. He's going to push some stuff out. But in that moment, we're not going to resist him. In that moment, we're going to say, God, make me holy even as you are holy. Right now, if you would close your eyes, every hand lifted all over the room.